And welcome everybody back to another episode of the Animals to the Max podcast. I'm Corbin Maxi, and I am joined with someone I've been watching, I feel like my whole life, you guys know him, Jeff Corwin. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Corbin. Glad to be here. Dude, it is insane. Your resume, I was, I mean, I've done a bunch of research on you and it's just like, you've done so much. You're a biologist, television personality, a wildlife conservationist. You have done a million TV shows. You're currently the creator and executive producer of Alaska Animal Rescue on Nat Geo. Man, you've done it all. Well, I've done a lot and there's still a lot more to do, but um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's like anything. It's like any career. You never feel like you're 100% where you want to be. You're always striving to be better, get better, reach a certain level. And, you know, that competition as a, as a, as a writer, as a television host, as an explorer, all those, all those wheels are always turning. Yeah. And I, dude, I want to get into your backstory. Like, how did this start? Well, I've always loved animals, and animals have always been a big part of my life. And uh, but you know, growing up, I didn't have a lot of access to nature. Um, my father was a police officer. My mom was a nurse. We lived in an urban environment early on, and the only time I ever connected with wildlife is when I would go visit relatives. And when I was six years old, I found a garter snake in my uh, grandparents' backyard, and that was just like the light bulb that switched on. That was like my gateway drug into nature and animals and uh and i studied that uh garter snake for two years and really began to exercise all my muscles a, as a naturalist with this garter snake and 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 finding that garter snake is when i became a naturalist and when i was about almost eight years old um i uh i actually watched someone kill that garter snake i went outside oh. my grandparents uh, and I was watching the snake and suddenly there was chaos and the next door neighbor saw me with the snake and snuck up and decapitated it, thinking I was in danger. And um, it was a very traumatic. And, and that and so I always say that the day I found that snake, Gladys, was the day I became a naturalist. The day I became a conservationist uh, was the day that someone killed her and realizing that good people often make bad decisions when they lack proper information. And, and that really um, um, uh, that really set me on my course. Yeah, and this is, um, I guess, kind of jumping ahead, but I remember watching, I think it was an episode of the Jeff Corwin Experience on Animal Planet. And I don't know if you remember this, but I remember someone- Morocco? Had, it, I, someone had killed a king cobra and you, I just- No, I, it wasn't a king cobra. It wasn't. It was, uh, oh, actually, you know what? There was a couple of- there was, we did the, a lot of really, we got into these really amazing stories of, of black market wildlife trade. We got in with this incredible organization um, called Wild Aid, and we became a part of these. And we were, at the, we were working with the government, and, and we would go in in these black market wildlife raids, and literally there would be thousands of cobras and crates and sea snakes and water anything you could imagine and they would say well we don't know how to process these things because you know they're so venomous i was a snake guy so i could help them work through these animals and i remember that was one that was pretty intense um and one of the workers ended up getting nailed in the eyes by a spitting cobra and then all hell broke loose because now it was a government thing and the government got, it was just crazy. But the time that I remember was um, we were filming in, in Morocco and we were doing this whole, back when we did the Jeff Corn experience, we'd often do these like reenactments from movies and pop cultural stuff. We were all, we had like a hundred Moroccan um, historical interpreter soldiers on horseback and I was on horseback with them. And right then I saw this person kill a Montpelier snake, this beautiful snake. And it literally was like flashback to being six years old again. And uh, then I realized I was yelling at all these guys and they all had bayonets and swords. So I took it down. But yeah, I think that I, I never saw, I don't think I ever saw someone kill a king cobra, but I remember seeing them kill that Montpelier snake and it was pretty it, crazy. 
it, it was it was a defining moment. I haven't I, I remember that like from the Jeff Corn experience that one episode. You were so fired up. I mean, just yeah, I, I I couldn't even imagine. And it's just man that that would be so hard for me to witness the wildlife markets. Like, what do you do? I mean, you know what I mean? Um, it's it's you know it's a challenge. Um, it, it's one of those things where you have to separate yourself from the whole uh, situation. I, I mean, since then, I have done so many stories in black market wildlife. I mean, I've done things with the black market trade of orangutans. And I mean, I've gone in and seen, you know, pangolins by the thousands in soup pots. And so you kind of, you don't get used to it, but you kind of get numb to it versus, you know, way back then, 20 something years ago, seeing someone kill a, a snake and freaking out. It's like, I mean, I've seen horrible things and you just know that you're there to tell that story. I mean, I was, uh, a, 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 after, um, the Jeff Corn experience and a few other shows, I became an environmental correspondent for CBS and then NBC and MSNBC. I covered the oil spill, but I, st I did a whole documentary called the hundred heartbeats. And that was all about getting to the core of the black market wildlife trade. And you just kind of accept that's the reality. And you're just there to tell the story. Yeah. And you are such a good storyteller. So let's go back to your childhood. You're eight years old and you grew up in Massachusetts, correct? I did. I grew up in, I grew up in a, uh, in this, in a city called Quincy. And then we moved to a more rural area, uh, in the country, um, when I was about eight and I, I lived three miles from where I grew up. So I still, I live in a little 22 acre Island, about a mile off the coast. Yeah. And I have to say, Jeff, I'm so disappointed. Where's your Boston accent, man? Like, does it come out sometimes? Oh, a, a couple of margaritas. It comes out. <laughs> Oh my God, dude. Do I have an accent to you from being from Idaho? Can you tell? I, you sound literally, it's like I could see you at the door, you know, ringing the doorknob with uh, coming to save my soul. Nice. That's <laughs> nice. Okay. So you're in Massachusetts. Uh, you, you become this conservationist. I mean, you seriously witnessed this horrific thing of this snake you watched for two years being killed. Where does your journey take you from there? I, I know you went to college to study animals. Well, I, you know, long before TV and stuff like that, I became very active in wildlife rehabilitation. Um, when I was 14, I, I worked with a pioneering group uh, of wildlife rehabbers. This is when wildlife rehabbing was very new. This is you know, back in 1983. Wow. And um, I still work with that organization to this day. I work with, with that, that wildlife group called the New England Wildlife Center. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, I, when I was about 16, I started traveling to rainforests. I got very intensely involved with rainforest conservation. I got invited. Uh, I used to, when I was, you know, like 12, 13, 14, I helped a herpetologist. I used to take care of all his snakes, and he was a professional herpetologist. He was doing research, and he said when he when I was old enough, he'd take me on one of his field projects, and he did when I was 16, and that totally transformed my interest in nature, tropical rainforest. My goal was to learn everything I could about rainforest, and especially with creatures that I had a great interest in, like bats and snakes and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I created back in the... Uh, uh, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, I created a rainforest conservation organization. And at that time, this uh, there was a group of us that we kind of, we all met at Princeton University uh, at a conference. And then at the United Nations, I got invited to a conference there. And I created a, a group that focused on saving rainforests. And I felt that was really what I was going to do for my whole career was be, you know, a, a tropical ecologist um, and go in the field of, of advocacy for the environment. And while I was, you know, and I started doing that as a teenager and then went to college. And then my, this group I created in college became pretty successful. We had, you know, created one of the first national parks in Paraguay um, and we were having great success. So, you know, my day job when I was home is I was a college student. And then my night job was 
I ran an NGO and was traveling all over Central and South America doing field work. And uh, it was at that time I got pick, featured in a documentary and I really loved that experience. I was like, this is what I wanna do. And that kind of refocused me and, and back around 1994, uh, 95, I created this idea uh, where bit, I was like, you know, it's been a long time since since there's been a Marlon Perkins and, you know, there's a David Attenborough who's great, but he's for a different audience. I said, we need like a naturalist, an adventure, animal loving person for the MTV generation. So I came up with an idea and pitched it, pitched it, pitched it, literally went in my backyard with, or my friend's backyard and borrowed a snake and this and let the snake go and jumped off a canoe and caught it and filmed it on my friend's video camera. And then, and kind of started giving up on it because it didn't seem like it was going anywhere. And then two years later, the phone rang and it was Disney and Disney channel had just rebranded and they were going away from cartoons and, and creating a different type of programming with actors and all sorts of stuff. And, um, I was that new generation of Disney stars with, um, Britney Spears and, <laughs> and Ray J and all these guys, except they wanted their animal guy. And that's what I did. And that was that was called Going Wild, and that lasted for three years, and then I went right into Animal Planet. It's just been that steady, trying to always evolve, go to the next thing. Yeah, how old were you when you were trying to pitch your show for two years? I was. I began, I think, when I was 24, and it happened when I was about 27. Wow. So I literally was just about done. I was like, all right, I got had just gotten married. I was in graduate school, struggling in graduate school, trying to figure that out. And I'm like, all right, so this may not happen. So I need to come up with something else. And um, I always liked acting and I would do voiceovers. So I actually started doing voiceovers for cartoons because I, I was always good with languages and, and you know creating sounds. So I was doing voiceovers as an actor. And there was a TV show on HBO way back then when HBO just came out. And one of the actors shared this studio and I told him about my passion to create the show. And he's like, oh, you should meet my pro the producers I work with. And they loved the idea and they got it into a TV series. Wow. But I it did... took a while, a long while. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people who aren't in the industry, they don't realize how long it takes because I think some people are like, oh, well, I mean, it'd be so easy just to have a show. And it's like, no. <laughs> no, it isn't. And, and, and just because you get a show doesn't mean you're going to keep a show so i was very lucky so my first series ran for three plus seasons and in television that's actually considered a long time my second series which was jeff corn experience that ran for like six or seven series and that was wildly successful that was like an international show i would like travel to like india and like have to get security or go, and it was crazy. It was as it was as popular, if not more popular, in like Southeast Asia, Central and South America. It's still on today in those countries, but you know. And then you, I thought, okay, well, I, you know, I, I figured this out. I'll always have this success. And then you have things that bomb. I mean, I, I have I've had series that people paid a lot of money for and never, you know, left the pilot concept or. The pilot aired and no one watched it. And then that really affects your leverage. And then you kind of have to, sh you know, be scrappy and start over again. It's anyone in this business knows that you're, you're only as good as what you're doing now. You could win all the Emmys and all the awards and have great success, but it's what, it, what can you do for them now for ratings, market, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, man. So was it easy when you were doing going? And by the way, so I grew up in the middle of nowhere in Roby Creek, Idaho. Have you ever heard of it? I've not heard of it. So I was so I, I had no friends and I would always catch like frogs and snakes and lizards and stuff. But I remember we had this little just horrible little satellite dish. But for some weird reason, we got the Disney Channel and Animal Planet. And that's when I was introduced to your show. And I loved it as a kid on Disney. How easy was it working with Disney? Did they give you a lot of creative control or um, did you enjoy well, that process? You know, even though I created that series at that time, I was very green. Um, and, um, they, uh, so I was attached, I was attached to this production company and it, it's like that classic thing. It, it was like, 
uh, I, I mean, the deal, the deal that I got then compared to deals that I would get now was completely different. Um, and I don't, I wouldn't say that I felt like I was owned, but, um, I didn't have, you know, and I would write the stories, create the stories. I would pre-scout things, all this stuff. And I loved it. It was incredible. But um, I felt like I was working for somebody. And even though it was something I created. And Disney really loved it. But, you know, you you reach this moment where suddenly, I remember I did this PR thing. And they're like, oh, would you do some PR stuff for us? And that, and they're like, okay. So they, they said, oh, would you go to Hawaii to meet and greet with fans? I was like, sure. You know, I'm thinking it's going to be like, I'll go to the mall and there'll be some kids there. They had to bring in all this massive security. They had to shut the event because people were pushing against the windows. Wow. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is really big. I, you know, this, I, you know, I got to be a part of something really big, but I never felt like it was mine. I felt like I was a part of it. And then there was a time where, but that moment only lasts so long. And if you know anything about this business, one minute you're really popular and then someone else comes along and Hannah Montana came along. And <laughs> so Hannah Montana pretty much uh, clipped my Achilles heels, uh, you know? And I remember like, they, it's like, okay, there for three years. Uh, and I was, even though, you know, I was like probably 27. I, if you look at pictures, I look at pictures. I looked like I was 18. Um, and uh, it's a credit, you know, back then, almost 30 years ago or whatever it was. And, um, but, you know, then it's like, literally you start, you feel like you're aging out of what they want. And, and I remember when I knew things weren't gonna go swimmingly is when I had to do a rap video with Ray J <laughs> and it was this rapper and I just met him and uh and we had to do this like PR marketing rap for Disney I'm like uh oh here it goes <laughs> this is it I'm... and then the time slot started changing and then they started doing these things with the show like putting in these interactive things and and you just know it's it's uh, when you, whenever you get that moment where you start filming a TV show, it's like literally finding out you have a terminal disease. It's like you want to eat your life and enjoy it because you know it's not going to last for a long time. And I've been lucky. I've had a number of series. My ABC series, I've had two of them have been Ocean Mysteries was five years. Ocean Treks, you know, in theory, it's still in production, but COVID you know, no one's going anywhere. Um, so um, I've been lucky. I've had some things that have run really long, but I've had my share of, of calamity and failure. I mean, it, it, and oftentimes it's the show that I felt like I did the least for that does the best. And the show that I worked the most on does the least. It's the weirdest thing. Like you think, oh, this is going to be the hit and it doesn't hit. And then it's like, Someone says, oh, we're going to take your show and make a compilation series, run it on NBC, and it gets huge ratings and gets nominated for five Emmys. And it's like, <laughs> okay, you know, you never know. I still haven't figured out this business. Yeah, I feel like that's the same with viral videos. Like, I'll be like, oh, this will go viral. And then something as simple as me, like changing the pump in my alligator pool will just skyrocket. And it's like, how could this go? It, you just, you never know. It's so crazy. You don't know. And, and especially with social media now. And I got into that really late. And uh, um, it's it's just, and, and there really is, I think for a while, people try to um, make, you know, if you were gonna make it in TV, you had to have incredibly strong social media. And I think they've discovered that, for example, you may have like a billion Instagram followers, but unless they're the right Instagram followers, that's not necessarily gonna to translate to ratings. Yeah. And I actually have was up for a job. So now it's like you get to this point and where people will say, where you even though you're doing something else, my agent will be like, hey, you know, a and E just called, and they want to know if you're interested in hosting a show, and, and not even about animals. I'm like, 
you know, I'll entertain it. Let's take a look at it or whatever it is. And I remember being up for a show and they were really interested and uh, they were like, oh, his social media isn't strong enough. And and I think they've a lot of these networks have learned, you know, it's probably helpful to have up to million, you know, Instagram followers, but that does not, or, or especially like, I think Twitter followers. But I, when I got in the news business, I would see like someone would come in and they would have tens of millions of Twitter followers or whatever, and, or let's say, six million Twitter followers, and it did not translate to ratings. So, but it, it's just, it, I mean, the business is constantly changing. And the first thing you learn if you wanna survive the TV business or the entertainment business is you must be ready for rejection because no matter how big you make it, someone is always ready to cut you down to show you how really tall you are, which is about this big. Dude, welcome to my life. Um, no, and it's true. And I just want to say, because I was late to the game with social media, Jeff. Like, I was 100% late. I got my start on Leno when I was 14. And I was like, oh, this is great. I'm 14 years old. Then I'll have a show on Animal Planet. And then my life's going to be great. And I won't have to worry about anything. And that's just not how my journey went. And that's not the reality. But I was late, too. And you are up against people. But then you have people who are buying followers. And I feel like there's a difference from people who actually have the experience with the animals or on camera. Because... You could make something great with your phone, cut it up, add some music and put a filter. But how would that person be out in the field working with an animal or presenting in front of an audience? I think it's just, I think networks are realizing that, you know, and people who are buying followers, it, it, that doesn't help at all. They're not, they're fake. And, you know, someone who has the attention span of a minute may not be the best target audience for an hour long show because they, you know, <laughs> What you have time for this is not the same as what you have time to sit down in front of a TV. I think people look at the mediums very, very differently. And, you know, I have shows that rate incredibly well. Um, right now, you know, my show gets rates really, really well. It's one of the top rated shows in his time blocks. You know, it doesn't necessarily translate, though, to social media. Um, it, it's just... I think there's a cert. I mean, some social media is very strong, like Facebook and stuff like that. I but some of the other, it's like I, as you also, I also don't necessarily get it. It's like it, it, you sometimes feel, sometimes you feel like you're doing it because you have a, a, an important story to tell, and sometimes you just feel like you're doing it just because you have to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, that's, that's, yeah, it's just where the world is now, you know, you know what was really fun, Jeff, you should get, I know you've heard this a million times, right, but you should get on TikTok, man, if you aren't already, TikTok is really you fun. You know what, I, my kids, my daughter, my teenage daughter begged me, please do not get on TikTok, she, <laughs> the biggest fear is to see her dad on TikTok, I got TikTok on my phone, and I had to get rid of it, because I was like, oh, I just spent the whole day in bed. But looking at TikTok, it, I found it. I, I think those China that that was definitely a, a weapon of social media war. Uh, I mean, it uh, it's crazy. So, I, and people have said that oh, you should get back, you should go into TikTok. It's kind of like you have to pick. I when I, what I what I do, I want to do it well and have it a meaningful contribution. You know, for me, like Facebook is. You know, I've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Facebook folks. And I feel like I get tailor stuff for them. I have a nice growing Instagram and I'm looking at some other stuff, but it's like, you can only do so much. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I hear you, man. I hear you. So let's go back to, okay. So you're done with Disney. You land animal planet, the Jeff Corrin experience. And that's, I feel like probably what's your most, wouldn't you say one of your most popular shows, what you're most it known still for? Is, you know? It still is. Yeah. Jeff Corwin experience or in Brazil it's, or South America, it's Jeff Corwin in action. <laughs> I uh, like that better. I think. <laughs> I know. And, um, um, and uh, it's like, it's still in Italy. It's popular in Italy. That's um, so my, cool. My friends in Italy were just saying they were just watching it. Um, you know, um, I love that series. Uh, it, that's when I, I really got to exercise some creative muscles. I think, it came out at just the right time where pop culture and the way entertainment was changing, it really integrated into pop culture and you would see it like 
in a cartoon in the New Yorker. You know, my my dad sent me this thing of in the New Yorker where someone, you know, one of their cartoons, or it was, you know, other shows where like, you know, I remember Brian Cranston showed up at a shoot I was at dressed up like me because he was a fan and wanted to pretend like he was a stalker and just oh. literally walked into the set and I was dressed up like me with my blue shirt and my shorts and my snake stick and he showed up with the blue shirt shorts and a and a golf club to help <laughs> me. Now it really was interesting to see that happen with that series. And it was just the time it came in. It was at the height of Animal Planet's popularity. Um, and I think people were kind of wanted to have fun. They wanted to have the adventure, see the wildlife, but have fun, but not have fun in in a, in, in an exploitive way of the wildlife, but have fun in like, you know, just having a sense of humor and laughing at things that go wrong. Or my whole team, we loved movies. We were addicted to movies, and all of them are, you know, inner Steven Spielberg. So we would always create these little intricate you know, little side story. So when we're in Australia doing a show in Dingo's, whatever, on the side, we're creating this side story about Mad Max. And, you know, ha and at some point they're going to integrate. Um, when, you know, when we're in Louisiana doing a show on alligator snappers and cool conservation with barred owls, we have this s sidebar story about deliverance, you know? <laughs> and, and it was just a very different, quirky style of show. That was just a lot of fun. I think and that, people really liked it. Yeah, I think that separates your show from all the others. It was fun. I was watching some of your some of the the best moments or funniest moments last night, and it, no, you're just like the, the way that the narrative. I think it was just so fun. I think my favorite, I think my favorite blooper scene was when you were like, "Now if an elephant charges, don't run, stand your ground," and that Asian elephant ran towards you. You guys were like, "Booked it." We just scattered. I know we just scattered. <laughs> <laughs> or th this young orphan elephant we were helping with kept, um, you know, the part that everyone I got so many letters about was like, he kept sniffing around my private area. And I kept pushing his <laughs> trunk away and I just went, I said, I'd give you peanuts. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, you could do that. And, and, and we always had these, you know, and how that show came to be, because when, um, uh, going wild wrapped up the production company I worked with they were like well we, we're gonna get you something else don't worry and and when you have your first TV series get canceled it's pretty horrible because you think your whole dream has come to an end and will there be another chance and sometimes there isn't um, you know sometimes what's left for you is Hollywood Squares oh. and I've done that which is actually a lot of fun I like doing <laughs> Hollywood Squares um, and um, and, and they pitched me to Animal Plan. They're like, oh, yeah, we saw him. He's a little too much for kids. And they sent them this blooper rail, you know, which was, you know, all the off-color stuff, all the the jokes, the pranks. the, the all, And they said, that's what we want. We're going to call it the Jeff Corwin experience, and that's what we want. And that's what we created. And, and, uh, and it really helped that I had a team, you know, of – you know, my camera, my camera guy became one of my best friends. And, you know, we, we literally were a family on the road. So we, we just loved to have fun together. We were constantly ribbing each other. And that I think is what built the spirit of that series and made it what it was. Yeah. And so who was first, I mean, I know you get probably asked about him all the time, but who was first on the scene, Steve Irwin or your show? Cause they were all in about the same time. They came out at the same time. Um, I think we came out within months of each other. He debuted on Animal Planet, and then I came out on Disney Channel. Okay. And um, and yeah, so I think I, I don't remember who came out first, but I remember people would mix us up all the time. They still do, and I remember I couldn't because I actually never w watched the shows. Um, and like I would watch little cuts of it, but like I never watched animal shows because I felt you feel competitive or you feel like, man, I wish I had done that or it or it feels a little like work in a way. So, I, you know, I, you know, I'm watching movies. I'm watching Pulp Fiction or I'm watching my favorite, you know, Arrested Development. I'm not watching something like that. Um, and uh, and I remember people kind of mix us up and, you know, someone like, hey, 
Jeff Irwin. And they were serious. I'm like, who, who's this Irwin guy? And they were like, hey, Steve Corwin. I'm like, who is Steve Corwin? And or someone would say, man, you really should be careful with those crocodiles. I'm like, I haven't even done anything with crocodiles. <laughs> So, and then I finally figured out, I was like, oh, there's this whole other guy. And, 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 uh, and it's very interesting. I never met him and, um, we never crossed paths, but I ended up after he died, I ended up filming at his facility quite a few times and have, and have been able to work with his team. Uh, cause he, they have a, he has an incredible zoo that he has over there, him and his family, and incredible wildlife rehab program. And I had the chance to um, work with them on, on a numerous, whenever I go to Australia, and <clears throat> I'm in that part of the world, I will probably go film with them and tell their stories because they do amazing stuff. Mm -hmm. Was it hard though? Because you guys were, <coughs> I mean, in reality, just compete. I mean, you guys were competing, I mean, on Animal Planet. You were you were two of Animal Planets. You were you were the, the, the two big stars. What, I mean, I for me, it would be hard. I would be like, oh, my God, I, I, I don't think I, it would be a lot for me. No, it doesn't because we were so different. Okay. We, were, we had completely different styles. We had completely different approaches. And it, I, I don't, you know, I think people mixed it up because of what we did because we both probably like snakes a lot. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, I never felt like, oh, I'm not going to do this because Steve Irwin did that. And I doubt that he thought that, um, he also was huge. Um, I mean, he built in uh, him and his family, Terry and his family, they built a, a, a huge enterprise. Um, and, um, but no, I, I, I never felt that. I never felt like we're competing with each other. And in fact, animal planet was cause I always, like to joke around and I'm always playing practical jokes. And, um, I remember one time, you know, doing like a, Hey, good idea. My, you know, doing something like that. And they were like, no, <laughs> we, you know, that's not going to work. And I was like, okay, I hear you. You know, and it wasn't like trying to be making fun, just having fun. And they were like, you know, that's your lane and that's his lane. You know, I was like, okay, I hear you. So, um, but no, it never was, there was never, I never felt the sense of competition with him and I never felt like we were stealing each other's thunder. Yeah. And I guess you guys were completely different. Your shows, complete different styles. Did you ever have networks say like, oh, you need to be more like, like we need you to be jumping on crocodiles now. Like we need to change you. We need to get your wife on camera. Um, no, 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 not really. I mean, it's funny, the Disney stuff they wanted me to change. I think when I think that's when they started noticing him a little bit. But not it's hard to describe, not become more like him. But they started they wanted to send me to an acting coach. And I'm like, oh, oh. my god. You know, it's like it's like they, they didn't they felt my style was too staccato or something. Um or to presenter like, and when I did do the Jeff Corwin experience, it wasn't presenter like at all. It literally was unscripted. What happened is what happened. I think that's what made that show really cool is it was never a script ever. Um, but no, there was never any, um, no, cause we had great ratings and we had a great audience and my audience liked me for what I did and what I do. So I never felt like, um, like, they wanted to change when they want to change. It's usually a big change. Um, and, and, and that to me was kind of a tough time where they wanted to make a big change. They felt like the Jeff Corn experience had lived its life. And while it was still doing really, really good, they switched everything. The production company, they changed the name of the, of the show to, um, um, Corwin's quest. And, um, it was about big missions and it was really scripted and it was all produced by a British production company. And the shows were huge, big budget, you know, one episode could be four different countries. Wow. Um, but it wasn't getting the same ratings 
wasn't hitting like, and everyone thought it was going to be, again, this great example of, well, you, you thought that was great. Now we made it even better. And I remember with this, every time I would say something ad lib or try to get off script, the director, this British director would be like, Jeff, what are you doing? Stay with your pop. <laughs> I'm like, uh, uh. And I'm like, no wonder we left your country. No <laughs> you have wonder a very, we had a revolution. You have a very good and, British accent, I have to and, say. Yeah, and um, it was just, and I remember um, with the director, and we had already, we were see, episodes were out, and we were filming in Florida, and this guy came up that we we're working with, was doing a thing on alligator snappers, and they wanted me to jump in the water and swim to the alligator snapper, and then it would connect to a story and on Caymans in South America. And I just couldn't keep track of it. I remember doing it and, and the, this guy's like, hi man, I love your new show, um, but I've got a question. And I'm like, what? And he goes, how can you not funny anymore? Oh. And the director was right there. And I went, ask him, <laughs> a, a, ask, ask Lurch. <laughs> So oh like God. I would, when I would tell it, we would joke, we would joke on, you know, and by the way, the crew, they got rid of my crew and everything. I now have that crew back with the stuff I do. I learned if you've got a great crew and you all get along and since you're a family in the road, you want to keep it together. And I remember like that big lesson, like when we would laugh a joke, we would have hysterical laughter. And I remember I'd crack a joke and you literally would just hear, <laughs> you'd hear a cricket. Oh, and uh, it's like, oh man, we have different you know, you know, you know, maybe I should have been more like Benny Hill or something. <laughs> but, well, yeah, you live and you learn. Yeah. Yeah. Where is your favorite place you've ever been around the world? Well, so many places I've spent. A, I love places where I go to so much that they become almost like a second home. Like I have my favorite restaurant, my favorite place to jog, my, you know, my friends that are there. So New Zealand has become like that for me. Um, Australia as Tasmania is one of my favorite places and I have a lot of friends there. Um, Alaska is a big, I've spent so much time in Alaska. I, you know, that I created a series and I'm not, I don't even host it. I produce it and create it with my partner, Patrick green, um, and for Nat Geo wild. And, um, uh, and that, when I go to Alaska, it's like, I have all my friends there. I'm going to work all day and then I'm going to go fishing here. And, I love that sort of feeling that you have where it feels like home. You, and, and I love places where you have incredible wildlife and adventure, but um, there's cultural things to do and there's good places to experience. It's not like in a war zone. I've filmed in places that are practical war zones. So it's oh. a cool wildlife story, but then you're kind of sequestered in your hotel room at night and that's never any fun. Um, but um, and I, 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 but I love Alaska. I love the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'd love like uh, I'd love doing those marine mammal stories. Um, and um, but I, I, I really enjoyed New Zealand. I, I remember I didn't get to New Zealand really late in the game. We never went there on any of my Animal Planet stuff. It was Ocean Mysteries that we got sponsored by New Zealand to come over and do some shows there. I'm like, oh, what are we gonna film a couple of birds? You know, I was blown away by the wildlife, and they gave us such incredible. Once we got in the door, it was like, you know, you know, like, oh, okay, Jeff, go down that hill right there. <laughs> yellow-eyed penguin out. So I'm literally grabbing yellow-eyed penguins and fur seals and catching the Roth. I was work, working working with this Kiwi um, scientist. And she was studying the Rothschild kiwi, and there's only 300 left. And she was, I was, you know, genuinely helping her with her work, and knowing you're holding one of 300, working with the Maori people to tell their conservation stories. It's just, I, I, I was taken aback working with Tuataras. Yeah. Um, and actually really incredible research and helping relocate nests and relocating a nest where the science she scientist she told me she told me that you know this nest still has more time it's been incubating for two years oh my like, gosh we're hoping that maybe in a one more year three years of incubation they'll hatch out I'm like that's incredible um so it was i love new zealand i love australia especially i love tasmania i love the creatures 
um, cause you get great reptiles, tiger snakes and, and blue tongue skinks. And then you get all the echidnas and the oh. cool wallabies. I remember I was in, in, um, in, in Tasmania a couple of years ago, uh, in the capital and I found an old book and it said, Oh, if you go to this stream and it was literally called linear park, it was a park that was um, about 600 yards wide and about half a mile long, hence its name, Linear Park. And it was right near a tired hospital and kind of a dodgy part of Hobart, which is a very small but really cool, funky city, Hobart, uh, Tasmania. And I'm walking down this stream, and it's kind of a tired-looking stream. I wouldn't say dirty, but just kind of like, eh. And I'm... And I see the splash and I see a duckbill platypus oh, just wow. come right over to my feet, do like a figure eight around me looking for yabbies. And then <laughs> I found three um, duckbill platypus and I spent all day in the stream studying them. I saw them fighting and going back and forth. And I bet you people in Hobart didn't even know they were there. Um, or very few of them. It was incredible. And, and, and I love experiences like that. That's amazing. Is there a place in the world that you have not been that it's on your wildlife bucket list, Jeff? Yeah, Antarctica. I've never been to Antarctica. It's it's hard to get to, and you have to go there for a long time. And I love Thanksgiving. It's my favorite holiday. I like to be home. And you kind of have to go for Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, so I've never been there. And, I, and we almost went for Ocean Mysteries a few years ago. Um, we had an opportunity to go and it just, we just couldn't make it happen. But I would, I'm working on a potential series right now and uh, on a new series and um, I hope it would be great to be able to go there. Yeah, oh my gosh. Do you have a favorite animal? Gosh, I mean, I love the monotrims. Mm -hmm. I, I love, um, I mean, they're just amazing. I remember just walking through a trail and coming across an echidna and you just look at what what makes an echidna so cool um i, I love uh you know flying foxes and the big fruit bats of asia and lemurs and um, penguins I, you know i never thought much of penguins till i worked with them and had a chance to do some really cool hands-on work with them and ha help take care of baby uh, orphan penguins. And they're just amazing, amazing creatures. And swimming with them, I've s swum with them off of Ecuador and Argentina and um, just so many creatures. Um, I, there's not a lot of creatures out there that I'm not impressed by. I mean, I just saw a goddess snake the other day uh, and it was like, just really cool. Just woke up, he's out there looking for food and a mate. and. It was just really cool to hang out with the garter snake on a trail in the woods near where I live. That's awesome. I heard a little bit of that Boston accent come out too. That garter snake. <laughs> snake. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The whole garter snake. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's amazing, man. I, you know, honestly appreciate you so much for coming on the show. Will you join me for our after show? Sure. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then, Jeff, where can people follow you and find you? I'll put all the links in the show notes. Yeah, so uh, on, so basically, just look for wild Corwin. So and it's and it's verified because there's a lot of non-verified stuff. So Facebook, it's wild Corwin. Instagram, it's wild Corwin, and that's kind of all I do for now. That's enough. Yes, and then uh, listeners, you can check out on Nat Geo Alaska Animal Rescue, which Jeff created and executive produced. He's not in front of the camera, but he's behind it, and which is a lot of fun. Yeah. And also on ABC, you can watch Ocean Mysteries and ABC. And hopefully a new project, which will be, if things stay on course, uh, it will be epic. It will be all about North American wildlife. And that's something we're working on right now. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Patrons, if you want to listen to the show, listeners, head on over to patreon.com slash animals to the max. With that said, Jeff, you ready to head on over to the after show? Sure. Let's do it.